Sudan's Darfur region and the 2008 Summer Olympic Games in Beijing. China is a major trading partner with Sudan. We'll hear from witnesses who say the U.S. should boycott the Olympics unless China does more to stop the genocide in Darfur. John Tierney of Massachusetts chairs this two-hour hearing. I ask unanimous consent that only the chairman and ranking member of the subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements, and without objection, that's so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee will be allowed to submit a written statement for the record, without objection, so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that the following written statements be placed, placed on the record. Uh, that would be Professor Eric Reeves of Smith College. He's the professor and author of SudanReeves.org website and Sudan advisor to the Olympic Dream for Darfur campaign. A statement by David Mazursky of the Horn of Africa Project Director with the International Crisis Group and materials from the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. I want to thank everybody who's uh, participating in this morning's hearing and, and our witnesses in particular, uh, some of the quotes uh, that were just on there about uh, the need to step up and do something is certainly uh, encompassed by what our students and the other witnesses here have done today. The Olympics have always transcended sport. It's always been about more than gold medals and world records and individual athletic achievements. The Olympics goes beyond the compelling stories of the athletes or their families their, or their loved ones. It's much more than an accumulation of all the athletes' dedication, countless hours of work, and limitless devotion to per perfection. The Olympics is that rarest of institutions in our modern age in which all the nations of the world put aside their differences and come together in a peaceful pursuit. It is aspirational, a call for what the world could be, and not about the individual and inevitable faults. The Olympics is a call to our better natures, a symbol of what we can achieve if all of us all the nations and the peoples of the world come together. The ancient Greeks had a tradition of the Olympic truce, or Echecheria, during which wars and battles would cease and all athletes, supporters, pilgrims, and artists would travel freely and unharmed to and from the games. The Olympic truce is carried through to the modern day and has been ratified repeatedly by the United Nations. But the Olympic spirit should go beyond a mere temporary cessation of hostilities. In 2000, North and South Koreans entered Sydney's Olympic Stadium under one flag. Just before the 2002 Olympics, the president of the International Olympic Committee, Dr. Jacques Roguet, publicly hoped that, and I quote, this peaceful gathering of all Olympic athletes in Salt Lake City will inspire peace in the world. And for the upcoming 2008 Olympics in Beijing, China, the host country chose the theme, One World, One Dream. We haven't always lived up to the Olympic ideal, of course. But that just underscores the importance of redoubling our efforts. The hearing that we're holding today asked a simple yet fundamentally important question. Shouldn't the upcoming Olympic Games in Beijing serve as the catalyst to finally put an end to the horrific and unfortunately ongoing tragedy in Darfur? The images of the genocide in Sudan are forever burned into our collective consciousness. 400,000 people dead. Kids killed and maimed in front of their mothers. Mothers raped and beaten in front of their kids. Entire villages burned to the ground. Atrocities and destruction on both the wide scale and on a very personal scale. Two and a half million people uprooted from their lives, their livelihoods, and their homes. We'll hear from one of those individuals today. And the tragedy and violence continue. The Boston Globe recently called it the unending agony of Darfur. Also, as we meet here today, scores and scores of refugees are living in camps, still fearing for their lives and depending on their aid for their very survival, aid and work is threatened today by the Sudanese government. For Dafaris who still today fear for their lives and their children's future, the glorious theme of the 2008 Summer Olympics, One World, One Dream, stands as nothing but an empty promise. And while the way forward in Darfur is complicated and will take a sustained effort, one thing is crystal clear. Expert after expert and report after report all stress the importance of a united world pressuring the Sudanese government in a coordinated manner to finally allow a full deployment of the hybrid African Union UN forces in Darfur and to ensure that humanitarian workers can go about their business without a fear for their lives. Sustained international pressure is also key in bringing all parties of the Darfur conflict together to craft a comprehensive and sustainable peace agreement. Far too often, Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir has played one country off against another whether in failing to disarm the Janjaweed or in blocking deployment of the 20,000 United Nations peacekeepers. The international community's lack of coordination and unity 
have allowed these atrocities to continue for far too long. That's why the International Crisis Group in a recent report stressed that international efforts need to be unified and that it is vital to build international consensus on a new political strategy, particularly with China and the United States, in order to acquire the necessary leverage over the parties to the conflict. An increase in focus has been placed on the host country of the 2008 Beijing Games as the linchpin in ending the atrocities in Darfur. Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Tom Lantis and Majority Leader Steny Hoyer sent a letter signed by 108 members of the House of Representatives to the Chinese President Hu Jintou on just this subject. A remarkable 96 senators joined a similar letter in that other body. And just this week, the House of Representatives voted overwhelmingly on a resolution by Congresswoman Barbara Lee asking China to do more. And the China-Sudan connection is made for good reason. China is Sudan's top trading partner and one of its top weapons providers. Over two-thirds of Sudanese oil goes to China. And the Chinese National Petroleum Company has recently built a 900-mile pipeline in Sudan. China has canceled $100 million in Sudanese debt and has even offered a, a nearly $20 million interest-free loan for the Sudanese government to build a new presidential palace. If anyone in the world community has leverage on the Sudanese government, it is China. And what better country to help lead the effort to end the tragedy in Darfur than the host of the 2008 Olympics? While China has recently made some initial steps to be helpful, I don't know of anyone who thinks that they couldn't do more. And this is not a question of one country infringing upon the sovereignty of another. It's a question of being a responsible stakeholder in the world community and of living up to the Olympic ideals at its temporary, as a temporary host. But it's not just China that needs to step up to the plate. The United States could do more, especially in helping to lead the multilateral effort. Former Secretary of State Powell courageously brought attention to Darfur by calling what's happened there genocide. And President Bush recently implemented some additional unilateral economic sanctions. But unilateral actions can only go so far. Success in Darfur now rests on the hard and sustained work of forging coordinated international pressure on the Sudanese regime. China could and should be doing more. The United States could and should be doing more. Russia could and should be doing more. The Arab League and the U European Union could and should be doing more. The Darfur tragedy has continued for more than four years, and the young people of our world are saying that enough is enough. Our young people are stepping up and playing the role of humanity's conscience. My wife and I recently attended a community presentation by a young constituent, Kimberly Pamelu. Kim's a 2007 graduate from Reading High School and had the courage and conviction to speak out to people twice or three times her age and to say, enough is enough. On our first panel today, we'll hear from two Massachusetts founders of the Dollars for Darfur High School Challenge, young adults whose initiative and creativity raised more than $306,000 and increasing still, counting to help the people of Darfur. When I visit high schools in my district, I hear again and again from students, enough is enough, that the horrible atrocities in Darfur simply cannot and should not happen in this day and age, not on their watch. I have right here in my hand letters from over a dozen students in just one school in my district, Linfield High School, on the issue of Darfur. These students and their terrific teacher, Casey Soderquist, are inspirations. The young people of the world are loudly and vigorously pointing the way, and it's past time for the rest of the world to follow. <coughs> Mr. Chase. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, for holding this meeting. Thank you for your very um, important statement. We're meeting today to learn how we can bring an end to one of the deadliest conflicts and worst humanitarian crisis of this century and last, the ongoing genocide in Darfur. After the Holocaust, and again after the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, the world community collectively agreed never again, never again would it allow such crimes against humanity to occur, but it is happening again. The security, human rights, and humanitarian crisis in Darfur has continued to deteriorate even after the signing of a peace agreement in May 2006. While I believe the genocide is finally getting the attention it deserves, the bottom line is the world community is not doing anywhere enough to help protect innocent lives. Today's hearing touches on what some would call a sensitive subject, which is the connection between China and its substantial investment and influence in Sudan and the Olympics, which China will host in 2008. We are all concerned China has slowed international efforts to resolve the conflict. It's one of the Sud Sudan's largest trading partners. 
China has hampered efforts to impose U.N. sanctions and deploy U.N. Na United Nations peacekeepers, continues to purchase Sudanese oil, and continues to provide aid to the very government that is complicit in the genocide in Darfur. I visited Darfur in August 2006 and cannot say enough about the critical work being done there by humanitarian aid organizations, including Save the Children, which is based in Connecticut. Whatever policies we adopt to end the killing in Darfur, it is critical we continue providing these organizations with the resources necessary to serve vulnerable populations, millions of vulnerable people. I am grateful that Dahoud Hari, who was placed in a Sudanese prison, among other things, is joining us today to testify. I've had the opportunity to meet with Mr. Hari, and I know his unique perspectives and recommendations come from a brave heart. I am also grateful that in addition to Mr. Hari and policy experts, we will be hearing testimony today from athletes and from students. Congratulations to our students. We've, we've heard from Connecticut. We're going to hear from Massachusetts. We could hear from every state, from students. Several of the largest rallies held here in Washington have been organized with the assistance of student groups and faith-based organizations, including in particular the Jewish and Armenian communities who consider this issue from a very personal perspective. Speaking of students, we just watched a clip of a short documentary, The Promise, produced by students from Darien High School in Danbury, Connecticut. It is heartfelt and beautifully done. What strikes me about the documentary is that it tells the story of genocide so plainly. And really, how, does, how do you tell such a story? How else do you tell such a story? The Promise includes the quote from Edmund Burke, all that is needed for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. This is not a cliche, but a warning and an admonition that we do whatever is required to end the genocide in Darfur. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Mr. Wells, do you want to make a comment? Uh, you've covered it, uh, Mr. Tierney and Mr. Chase, but I want to extend my congratulations to the students. Uh, Vermont, the biggest event that we had uh, in the last election campaign was a rally that was organized by uh, students uh, in the Burlington area, and we had several hundred people turn out. And what is extraordinarily exciting uh, from my eyes is to see young people getting involved politically, having a sense of their own power and a sense of their own responsibility to stand up and speak out against injustice and to advocate for human rights for all. You're an inspiration to us. We're delighted at your work. Uh, we know that today is just one stop along a long road to try to end the genocide in Darfur. And thank you all very much for what you're doing. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, I do want to hear from our witnesses, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you uh, to all the witnesses and uh, all of the students involved here today. Uh, Echoing what uh, Mr. Tierney and, and Mr. Welch and Mr. Shays have said earlier, uh, I see a lot of this in my district. Uh, there was a, a very active uh, effort by the students at Milton High School in my district and also Medfield High School uh, to, to try to support uh, uh, refugees and uh, other victims of the genocide in Darfur and calling, uh, calling upon their government ourselves to, to take action. Uh, I want to thank you all for the power of your example, because I think you speak for all the students and, and the younger generation in this country. And it's great to see the responsibility assumed by young people. It gives me great hope that, uh, that the next generation is very near the point of uh, asserting itself on some of the issues, not only in this country, but globally. So I thank you for your efforts on behalf of uh, all of the victims uh, of the genocide in Darfur. And I, I uh, congratulate you and uh, join with you uh, in trying to put more and more pressure, uh, not only on our own government, but uh, internationally, to take full responsibility and to stop the genocide in Darfur. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. I'd like to begin by introducing the witnesses on our first panel here this morning. We're honored to have the high school student co-founders of the Dollars for Darfur High School Challenge. And I want to point out that it just so happens that these student activists and leaders come from the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. 
Uh, we have Nick Anderson with us, and we have Anna Slavin with us as well. Uh, Nick and Anna's National High School fundraising competition on MySpace and Facebook websites generated over $306,000. And it's still uh, going to be working. Both of them entering their senior year are going to continue to do work on this issue so long as it's necessary. I want to welcome you both. And I do have to tell you that it's a policy of this subcommittee to swear in all of its witnesses. So if you'd be kind enough to rise and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the who, truth? Yes. yes. Well, the record will reflect that both answered in the affirmative. There's not going to be a question and answer uh, on uh, these particular witnesses, but we're more than uh, grateful for your submitting of uh, written testimony. We want to hear from you orally. You have the choice. You can either read to us your written testimony or, knowing that that's on the record, just feel free to uh, speak and tell us whatever you'd like in your time. Thank you. Thank Nick. you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I'm Nick Anderson, co-founder of Dollars for Darfur, the National High School Challenge to Stop Genocide in Darfur. In the United States, we are quite comfortable a blessing in striking contrast to what is occurring in the Darfur region of the Sudan. In comparison to my home state of Massachusetts, the number of people in Darfur who have died so far is equivalent to two-thirds the city of Boston, and the number left homeless is approximately a quarter of the state's population. Facts like these compelled me to act. I present to you today a bit of the history of our project. In July 2006, co-founder Anna Slavin and I flew to Washington, D.C. to meet with staff of the Save Darfur Coalition to encourage them to adopt Dollars for Darfur as one of their campaigns. We came with three main ideas. First, we intended to set up a national high school challenge that would both promote awareness of the situation in Darfur and raise money to be donated to Save Darfur and key relief organizations. Second, we proposed using social networking websites like Facebook and MySpace as a conduit to the Dollars for Darfur webpage. The web page provided information to increase awareness of the atrocities occurring in Darfur and had a scoreboard page that managed the national fundraising challenge. It was a unique format for de disseminating information as Facebook and MySpace more frequently appear in the news for negative reasons. However, we knew that this awareness and fundraising strategy had the potential to reach a staggering number of high school students. Given the 22,000 plus high schools registered with Facebook alone, we, term, we determined that if each school raised just $50, the total would be over $1 million. So we set a goal of reaching 1,000 schools and raising $200,000. In the end, we reached over 2,500 high schools and raised over $306,000. The third idea that we presented to the Save Darfur Coalition was to offer a prize of some sort to the schools that raised the most funds. This suggestion became a reality and sitting in this room today are representatives from some of the top 10 high school fundraisers nationwide. We also extend our gratitude to the Save Darfur Coalition for creating a winner's event beyond our greatest expectations. Anna and I started Dollars for Darfur because we wanted to bring attention to the horrific crimes against humanity occurring in the Sudan. We sought to harness the goodwill that we know is ubiquitous in students of our generation and provide them with a format to effect change. We aspire to define our generation as one that acted and made a difference. It was always our goal to motivate fellow high school students, but somewhere along the way, I realized that kids all across this country had deeply inspired me and opened my eyes to the power of individuals uniting to assert the indelible right to justice and liberty for all people of our global community. In towns and cities across the country, students joined Dollars for Darfur and inspired fellow students and community members to help stop the suffering in Darfur. Did you know that just $35 can provide two high-energy meals a day to 200 children in the Sudan? Some students who participated in the challenge could scarcely afford the dollar they gave, while others easily gave hundreds. Yet, in his or her own way, each united around this important issue and sought to define our generation as one of strength and moral fortitude. It is an honor for us. It is an honor for us to represent high school students from around the country. And Anna, could I ask you maybe pull that a little closer to you? I, I would love to hear it. And out in front of you as well. It is an honor for us to represent high school students from around the country and to be the voice to represent everyone who contributed to Dollars for Darfur at this important hearing. As Nick and I were developing Dollars for Darfur, there was one aspect that was of primary importance, the involvement of high school students. While some view high school students to be consumed with merely the trials and tribulations of teenage life, we saw something more. We saw a generation with a desire to make a difference. Our generation has struggled to find an identity. We are now recognized for our activism. 
Through this challenge, we have proved that given the right form, we can have an impact. Nick and I started Dollars for Darfur by simply inviting our friends to join our Facebook and MySpace groups and encouraging them to spread the word. The numbers grew exponentially. In just six months, more than 7,000 high school students had joined our groups. Teens across the country have devised creative and effective ways of raising money and awareness for the cause. For example, at our school, Northfield Mount Hermon, Evan Abrams helped raise more than $15,000 and amassed a Dollar for Darfur committee consisting of over 50 students. Evan and his committee sold, dorms, sold, sold pizza to dorms around campus and organized a series of tournaments held in our student center. Brian Sachs from Nevada organized a walk through the Vegas Strip, raising both funds and awareness. Christine Oxner from Clearwater Central Catholic High School organized a school-wide school dress down day in which students could pay to dress in the clothing of their choice rather than their uniforms. Numerous schools like Deerfield Academy and Athens Academy held benefits concerts both run and performed by students. Students from Wyoming High School even went door to door through their communities, educating people about the situation and receiving donations. Through these efforts, Dollars for Darfur raised over $300,000 in just six months. The success of Dollars for Darfur demonstrates two things about our generation. We have extremely effective social networks that can be quickly mobilized and we are passionate about ending the genocide in Darfur. I would like to read a few excerpts from the hundreds of messages students posted on Dollars for Darfur Facebook and MySpace sites to give you a sense of some of the incredible enthusiasm we encountered throughout the Dollars for Darfur challenge. Claire Helfrich from the American School of the Hague writes, this is great you guys, here in, here in the Netherlands, my school has done a Save Darfur campaign as well. With all our efforts and money, we can really make a difference. Christine Garrard from Oakton High School wrote, forget the imaginary lines that divide us from Africa. A suffering human being in Darfur is just as important as a US citizen and furthermore worthy of our attention, compassion, and aid. Finally, Alex Mandel from Solberry School posted the following quotation from Nelson Mandela. Sometimes it falls upon a generation to be great. You can be that generation. Our generation knows it will inherit a world with staggering problems. We simply can't wait for others to change the world. We must start now. Taking action to stop, Darfur, to stop the Darfur genocide is of great concern to high school students. According to a recent survey of 18 to 24 year olds conducted by Harvard University's Institute of Politics, the crisis in Darfur was identified as the most important foreign policy issue after stabilizing Iraq. Our generation will vote in 2008 and we will support candidates who work to promote human rights. We are grateful for this, to the Save Darfur Coalition for supporting us and believing in this idea. We would also like to acknowledge the work that members of this subcommittee have done to help end the genocide in Darfur. We extend our sincere gratitude for convening this hearing and listening to our testimony. Thank you, Anna and, and Anna, and, uh, and thank you, Nick. I think I can speak for all the members of the subcommittee that are here and those that have read your testimony and aren't here yet, uh, that it's uh, very impressive and your generation has certainly found its identity and human rights is about as good as you can do when you're looking for a cause. I understand that you have some representatives from some of the high schools that were leaders in raising the money. Uh, can we ask all of them to stand so we can acknowledge their work as well? Maybe they could say what school they were from. Just pass them the While you're up, while you're up, would you, uh, would you please stay stand just a second. Would you tell us your name and what school you, you attend and, and where? Well, thank you all very, very much. You're doing spectacular things. And Nick and Anna, thank you very much for your testimony. I think what you're doing is, uh, is tremendous, and, and you are just setting such a great example, and others are going to follow. And we'll look forward to watching you. This will not be the last we hear from either of you, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Thank we'll you. take a moment while we change panels, if we can.
The subcommittee will now receive uh, testimony from the witnesses on the second panel. Uh, we have an outstanding panel here uh, this morning, and uh, we're going to discuss the you know, Olympic spirit as a moral imperative to end the genocide and to foreign. And, and with us to do that, we have Dawood Daoud Ibrahim Hari. Uh, Dawood is a Dafuri refugee who has served as an interpreter to a number of uh, reporters, including Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times and other journalists in Darfur. Mr. Hari is, was taken hostage and tortured on a trip into Darfur with the Chicago Tribune correspondent Paul Solopec has suffered personally in respect to his family's uh, situation, uh, and uh, Dawood would respect the fact that you're here and what you've gone through and that your willingness to come forward and, and testify. We have Joey Cheek, American Olympic gold medalist speed skater. After Joey won the gold and silver in the 2006 Olympics, he donated his $40,000 medal bonus to a group helping Darfuri refugees. And since then, he's been a tireless activist on this issue. And Tegla Larupe is a Kenyan Olympic distance runner uh, who I declined her offer to train with her. She's <laughs> 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 a two-time New York City Marathon champion and a world record holder. United Nations Ambassador of Sport and Champion of Peace and Justice in Sudan and elsewhere in Africa. Thank you for joining us. And we have Jill Slavitt, the uh, Savitt, the director of the campaign to bring Olympic dream to Darfur. We have John Pendergast, Pendergast, the senior advisor to the International Crisis Group and co-founder of the Enough Campaign. We have the retired Ambassador Lawrence Rossum, senior international coordinator with the Save Darfur Coalition. I want to welcome all of you. I want to thank you. I want to ask you if you'd be kind enough to stand, please, and raise your right hands as we do swear in all witnesses appearing before the committee. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Let the Record, please reflect that all witnesses have been answered in the affirmative. And Mr. Hari, uh, if it's all right with you, we'd like to start with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, it's really hard for me to share my experience with you. Please uh, accept my written um, uh, a testimony for Derek Code. Um, my name is Daoud Ibrahim Hari. I'm the third refugee from Darfur in the United States since 2000, 2003 when the genocide against my people. I was born in Mosbad in North Darfur where I learned my English and I, my high secondary school and I'm a um, survivor for, of, uh, of the genocide at the end of 2003. The government of the Sudan and the Janjawi destroyed my village and killed my brother. They caused me to flee with the women and children to find safety in Chad. In Chad from 2004 until 2006, I became interpreter for NGO and international journalists seeking to expose the genocide in Darfur and refugee crisis in Eastern Chad and Central African Republic. I took this risk because I want to show the world that tragedies happening to my people. I even went back to Darfur with the journalists and some NGO a total for of six times to talk with the victims and I hear their stories. I remember interviewing with uh, Nick Kristoff of New York Times, 14 years old child soldiers of the Janjaweed in the area of Kloy. He was wounded by the villagers. He told us that the government of Sudan had paid them $200 to come to destroy this village. And if they succeed, they will, be, they will pay $700. And we have saw, and he was not the only Janjaweed, he told me that the government of Sudan had to pay for them for uh, the genocide. I also remember seeing how the Janjaweed killed the villagers in one case to dismember the family bodies and put them, put them in the village wall 
to poison the water resources for the, air, for the area. And also, when I went with the BBC, the border with Central Africa and Sudan and Chad, we witnessed for 81 person had been killed, a dead body were destroyed, and the several village that been burned down in the ground by the Yanjaweed. I myself, I myself then become a victim of the government of Sudan when they arrested, jailed, and tortured me with a Paul Salabat of the Chicago Tribune and assignment with the National Geographic and our drivers. I was sure that I would be killed. I would be killed. And it was a miracle for me that American politicians, including Chris Shea and Barack Obama and the governor of Belarusian, will able to secure our freedom after 25 days in jail. However, my people need more Merkel from America and the other wallet. Finally, to bring peace to my people and stop the genocide, I recommended that you pressure the government of China to not support the government of Sudan killing my people. Also, I am not the only Darfurian refugees is need of help and resettlement in the United States. There are Darfurians, refugees in danger, including women and children in the camp. 60% of the women refugees are widows who lost their husband. Thousands of children were heroin who lost their parents. We need the United States to provide special legislation for my people who are in constant risk. I thank America. I, I thank America for saving me life, my life, and I will continue to share my story with the American policy. I look forward to your question. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Hari. Mr. Cheek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the members and all the staff who've put together uh, this, this hearing today. And, and I think it's a timely issue and an important one, and I'm very honored and humbled to be a part of a panel uh, with as, as much uh, experience and moral weight as this one does. It truly is the thrill of a lifetime to compete in Olympic Games. I spent more than 17 years preparing and training and competing uh, so that I could compete into the Salt Lake Olympics in 2002 and then in the Torino Olympics in 2006 representing my country. I was a bronze medalist in 2002 and a gold and silver medalist in uh, 2006 in Torino. And oftentimes the American media, uh, it really plays up the, uh, the, the competitive aspect of the games. What really matters, we're led to believe, is who's the winners, who are the losers, what's the medal counts, and which nation stands on top. It is certainly the case that the Olympics is a competitive event. But in my opinion, having experienced two of them now, that's not the real majesty of the Olympics. I have a story that I like to tell, and it illustrates, in my opinion, really what I think the true power of Olympic sport is, and ultimately what the Olympic ideal, which we, we pay a lot of lip service to and, and oftentimes don't live up to, I think this story exemplifies. Uh, I'm asked oftentimes what my favorite memory is, and it's as, as outstanding to stand on the podium as a gold medalist with the national anthem playing and your flag raising. But one of my favorite memories is the very first time I walked into an Olympic village. Within the village, very few people are ever accepted in. There's no press. There's no family. It's just the athletes who've qualified. And you walk into this big hall, and the flags of all the nations that are competing are draped from the ceilings. And you walk in, and your eyes light up, because this is the moment you've dreamt of since you were 9 or 10 or 11 years old. And you look down, and you see all the athletes from the world. And it's this great tapestry of colors, because every nation wears their, their colors on their back. And at first, your, your eyes are so wide, and you're so struck by this, this experience you're finally making. It takes a little while for you to realize that as you look out, you see athletes from Europe and from Asia, from Africa, from North America, from South America, and we all sit at the same tables. 
we sit together and we break bread, and we eat and we laugh. And oftentimes, although when we compete on the field of play, we lay our heart and souls out there and we compete with all that we have, the cameras never catch us when we return and we're able to laugh and share our experiences and hug and talk about this shared reality that so few people on earth have ever got to experience. Uh, I said in my written testimony that it's not uncommon to see Japanese and Chinese athletes sitting together and talking, or Europeans from nations that our grandfathers fought to the death and decimated an entire continent, being best friends, being lifelong friends, and there's actually quite a few Olympic marriages, you'd be surprised. That story is never told about the Olympics, but to me, that one is something that exemplifies what this Olympic ideal is all about. We talk about, when you speak of the Olympics, you speak about sport transcending uh, a mere competition. We talk about being able to use sport to promote the values of peace and common brotherhood and humanity. And oftentimes, it's just, uh, it's just kind of boilerplate. It's something that sounds nice. The only way it can be a true uh, reality is if we take that flowery language and we choose to live it in our everyday lives. After the 2006 Olympics, when I was a gold and silver medalist, I had a brief moment of uh, media spotlight. And I thought of all the lessons that I learned from sport, and I realized the most important one was that myself, an athlete from Europe, an athlete from China, an athlete from Africa, many of us have much more in common than we have different. In fact, I may have something more in common with a speed skater that grew up competing in China than I do with someone I may meet walking down the street. As we get ready in the next year and a half for the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing, many people are going to say, I don't see the connection between uh, a, a sporting event and a genocide going on on the other side of the world. In fact, I believe uh, one of the foreign ministers of China was just quoted in the, in the uh, Washington Post saying, uh, that there are many activists who are trying to link this and that they'll fail because politics in the Olympics don't, don't match, they don't, they, don't, they, don't, uh, they don't mix. And I think uh, with all due respect that that's the exact opposite message. I think he's absolutely incorrect. The sole reason we have an Olympics is so that we can live up to the ideals that we profess. It's already been said, of course, the, the financial relationships between China and Sudan. But I think it's also important to point out that by choosing to host an Olympics, China in particular looks to use this as its coronation on the world stage. They are a, a, an enormously developing nation. They're, they're, they're going to be a world power, if they're not yet, very shortly. And you don't get to host the Olympics. You don't get to host this great event with all of the glow and all of the good feelings that come along with it without accepting the responsibility of what you're proclaiming. It is my intention as, as we go through for the next year and a half and prepare for this Olympics to, to travel out into the world and tend to begin to recruit athletes not just from the U.S. because I think that the U.S. has already done a, a reasonable job and I think will continue to improve uh, in terms of what we uh, are working on to try and stop the genocide in Darfur, but to recruit athletes from all over the world because it's not just nations that have to live up to the Olympic ideal. I think the athletes that are competing also have a responsibility. So I founded an organization entitled Where Will We Be? And uh, over the next year and a half, I seek to bring other athletes because as the, the glow from the Torino Olympics fades and the star of the Beijing Olympics ascends, I think it's vital that new, new young hearts and new energy are brought into the fight. I hope that by the time the Beijing Olympics begin, we don't have to have another testimony, another hearing about this. I hope that the nations of the world have, uh, have lived up to this responsibility. I hope that the competing nations in the Olympics will live up to the ideals that they profess. But I believe that if they're not ready to make that decision, that the athletes of the world will have to take a leadership position in that respect. I appreciate you giving me the time, and uh, I also thank you deeply for making this an issue and keeping this on the national and the world stage. We appreciate your testimony, Mr. Chief. Thank you. Ms. Lupe. Thank you, Chairman, the House, the athletes, and the students. It's a great honor for me to be here today to represent Africa as Olympic athlete. My name is Tegla, and I'm from Tegla Lorube Peace Foundation. 
I'm still active in sports. Don't turn down my offer. <laughs> I would like to share with you today about the spirit of Olympic peace through sports. It has a powerful role to play, to play in our lives. For the first five years, I asked my friends from Africa, Holland, Germany, and South Africa to have a race for peace in Kenya. I want to inform you that I come from a conflict place close to Uganda. I witnessed when people were dying. We used to run away from school. And when I compare what is going on with, with Sudan, I know what it means. In 2003, I came and asked our federation, I would like to have a peace race in that provision, and they refused. They say we cannot go there because there is AK-47. In a tiny place called Kabenguria, where the Sudanese came and stayed, including the family of Dr. Dalet Karang, I did not know what to do, and I asked again. The peace race will bring people, and for the last 13 years, I've been the best athlete in Kenya. There was no race being given in that region. In the night of that day, Dr. Karang from, he was in Uganda, he called me, I never saw his eyes. And he told me, listen, I'm a great admirer of yours. You've been fighting for your own people. You've been fighting to be one of the best athletes in Kenya, but your federation has turned you down. But don't stop to make that peace race, because peace is the best thing for us. If you know what it means to have peace, don't stop. I was really shocked. The following day, I went to our parliament. I was to talk with only four members of parliament that I know. I asked, I would like to have peace race, four women, and all of a sudden, I had almost like 10 ministers surrounding me. And they told me, listen, Degla, it's not only for women, it's for men. Let the race be for all people. I say, I've got no time. I don't have money. Some of the Sudanese who stay in Nairobi, they came to me and said, listen, together with your government, we are going to help you. Go and train. Well, I went for training. I came back and we had peace race in Gapenguria, whereby we were able to bring warriors and they returned their weapons and they asked for education. Today in Africa, we have many conflicts. Some are caused by tension of over scarce resources. Some are caused by ethnic tribals. Some are caused because of dispute of fair distribution of oil, diamond, or resources of wealth. Today, conflict in Darfur, it has all the content of elements of all these. Darfur crisis is a very painful issue for the people of the continent of Africa and other parts of the world. As we discuss about Darfur today, there are so many children, many boys and girls, many Olympians, are losing their lives. Women and old people are dying day and day. It's our challenge today to stand. It's not a time for pointing fingers. It's not a time for fearing one another. It's not a time for politicians to come in. We have to save our human being. Women of power, it is time for us to stand up and visit those areas. It's not a point whereby people visited the government for half an hour and they fly away. It's only that you attract the media. People in the countryside, they don't have televisions. I say because I come from countryside. When people come to Nairobi and talk about the peace in, in Sudan, when people come to, to Nairobi and talk about the problem between the borders of Uganda and Kenya. Those who are playing around the world, those who are playing for child soldier, they don't understand. If only somebody can come and sit down there and talk with the people, they will understand. 
Why we use sports today? Because there is no politics. There is no difference. There is no diplomacy. You can be rich, you can be president, you can be who. But when people come together to share their feel, you can understand one another and with respect. We know that the Chinese are supporting the government for Sudan. But if only Africa Union can come in and stand firm, because they know the culture, the other people will not play a lot. When we see the problem in Darfur, it's not only the Sudanese people to suffer, we all suffer. Especially when I'm a woman and many other women, when they see children dying, we invest so much, nine months, and maybe more, another five years, and that kid would be a soldier. It breaks the hearts of the women. So it's just time to tell the people in China during the Olympics that we should not only stop for a few days for the Olympics to continue, for the Chinese to understand that people are going to their country for one, for one reason, Peace and peace is, is our dream. Sports is our dream for everybody. They should see that their businesses that they deal in, in Sudan should bring peace, but not pain in the eyes of the children, in the eyes of the poor that cannot talk. Today, I want to ask the Congress that you have to come forward and help. You are the voice of the voiceless of these people who are suffering. It's your duty, it's my duty, it's the duty for everybody in this house to stand firm and tell the whole world we have to visit Sudan. And tell the leaders of Sudan, it is time, it is now. The rich people, they don't stay there with their kids, they are away. They are there to play. I want to tell you one example. In in 1999, I was running a marathon in, in Holland. All of a sudden, I saw my own community. I saw in CNN, and I saw some people that I know that they, there was conflict there. I realized that, and when I called home, my brother-in-law was killed, and because of conflicts. I really went home. When I came to Frankfurt, I met with one of the politicians. And I know he was, one the, he was one of the people who fired the arms. He asked me, where are you going? I, we start to quarrel in the airport. I say, I'm going home. He said, that place, there is fire. And I said, my father is still there. I know he's a, he's a farmer, and he will never leave the place. And he told me that I'm going to Norway to see my family. I thought the next thing I will be put in jail by the Germans. I told, listen. I know the poor people are dying, but you people, you point the problem and buy, give the money to the poor to fight themselves. That is what is happening today in Sudan. Really, when I came home, people, have, people they were not staying there except my family and few of them. My father told me, listen, do you know how to use, use uh, any, any weapon? I say, listen, my hands are already asleep. And he told me, listen, you are important. Don't stay with us. Go to the training camp. I said, where? In the other side of Marquette. There was forest I could not go. And then I said, why? He said, in sports place, nobody will kill sports people. These are old men who cannot understand what it means to, be, to play sports. Today, sports can bring people together. So as I said, it's time for us. Let us use our resources. Let's look at our people. We are human beings. And I want to ask the country who have not signed against the small arms treaty, please do so. I know it's a business, but I'm telling you, it's not, going, it's not only going to stay in Africa. It will come to us. The son of a woman laid the fire in a grass. The fire with blind. The fire is a blind. Uh, thing, but it will come to us. It has to draw water or peace to destroy the, by, the fire of hatred.
Let's sign the Treaty of Small Arms. It has destroyed the students. The, any other person, even rich people, you don't have, you don't have peace because when you are wealthy, somebody's after you. So may God bless you all and let us stand and be strong, all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lupe. Mr. Pendergast. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I used to be an athlete, so maybe you can train with me as preparation. For <laughs> There's been a lot of talk about Darfur. In fact, in my quarter century now of working in Africa and on African issues, I don't think there's ever been a wider gulf between rhetoric and action. Uh, just this morning, I, I saw him come across the airwaves, our, our president talking about Darfur, and he said, uh, I'm, I'm frustrated, but the international organizations can't move quickly enough. I don't know how long it's going to take for people to hear the call to save lives. I will be stressing, along with Tony Blair, the need for nations to take action. If the UN won't act, we need to take action ourselves. And I laid out a series of sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. A crucial misperception, I think, has to be corrected if we're going to be effective in Darfur. The UN doesn't move by itself. It has to be moved by the brain inside the United Nations, which is the United Nations Security Council. The most powerful nation in the Security Council is the United States. The UN moves when the US moves it. I worked in the last administration and spent a lot of time doing this stuff. It simply doesn't happen unless we move. So to displace responsibility to other nations or international organizations, which we're the dominant member, does a disservice, I think, to the cause. The US needs to lead in the United Nations now if we are going to take action that's going to change the calculations of the regime in Khartoum, in Khartoum and get the peace deal and the protection force that everyone agrees is this, are the central objectives in Darfur. So the urgency now is multilateral action, is leading in the United Nations. The unilateral actions we've taken have been tapped out. They've been discounted by the regime many years ago. It's harder work to work multilaterally. We have a lot of other issues on the agenda. So let's understand and, and respect the fact that Iran and North Korea and Iraq and other issues are taking up our time and energy. But eggs are going to have to be broken. And we're going to have to expend a little bit of our leverage, or as the President says, our, our, our moral and our political capital, if we're going to move this issue uh, in the United Nations Security Council. And the fact is, you know, the great news is, is that when we've done that in the past, including during this administration, when we've worked multilaterally, we've actually made a difference in Sudan. There have been three cases in the 18 years this regime has been in power where the United States has led multilaterally and there has been a major change on the ground in Sudan. The first time was, was during the 90s when bin Laden lived in Sudan and terrorism was the order of the, support for terrorism was the order of the day with Car the Khartoum regime. The U.S. led, bin Laden was kicked out, the Al-Qaeda infrastructure was dismantled, and we saw a real change. Second time, slavery. All of you have, have known and heard about this, the issue of slavery in Sudan. The U.S. led in multilaterally, and the, and, the, and the regime capitulated, stopped arming the militias that were doing the slave raiding. It ended. The third time has been just in the last couple of years when the U.S., when the Bush administration led internationally, multilaterally, to get a peace deal between the North and the South that everyone said was impossible to reach. There is a track record here. We've just got to actually act. Uh, uh, so, we, the, the, so what does it mean to act in this context? Well, of course, uh, what we have now is four years in Darfur where there's been no real cost for committing genocide, no cost for obstructing the United Nations from this. And without a cost, this will continue. It would be irrational, frankly, for the government of Sudan to stop pursuing a military solution if there is no cost, multilateral cost. That isn't plan B, because plan B was largely unilateral. We have to move multilaterally, and I think there are five things we can do, five things the United States can take the lead on that would actually make a difference in Khartoum and change the calculation of the government of Sudan. First, we need U.S. leadership to get the kind of uh, sanctions that, that we've imposed on the businesses in Sudan Unilaterally, we need to multilateralize those. We have 160 co Sudanese companies now on a list that we freeze their assets, we go after their, their business, we try to target their businesses. We need to multilateralize those through the United Nations Security Council. That takes leadership. Second thing we can do, same, same, same approach, through the United Nations Security Council, take the idea of individually sa sanctioning the individuals 
who are most culpable and most responsible for genocide and crimes against humanity and multilateralize those through the Security Council. And there are three people, and I want to name names, because there are three people who have been most responsible for the destruction of 400,000 lives in Sudan during the last four years. And there are three people that haven't yet showed up on our lists because we're protecting them because they're the ones that are giving us a lot of information in our counterterrorism cooperation. We're going to have to make a stand here and decide what makes the most, what makes, what, what matters most to us. The three people are the assistant to the president, Ali Nafi Ali, Nafi Ali Nafi, sorry, the director of intelligence, Saleh Abdallah Ghosh, and the minister of De defense, Abdul Rahim Mohammed Hussein. Those are the three guys that we need to act. If we don't ar ar target the orchestrators, these sanctions are not going to bite. Third thing we can do, whether you agree or not with the International Criminal Court, whether or not we support the ICC, whether or not we sign the ICC charter, we can quietly provide intelligence, declassified intelligence to the ICC that can accelerate the indictment process. There is nothing that will get their attention quicker if the United States quietly says to them, okay, we've given you four years We've got information that will lead to the directly to the prosecution of some of the senior members in this regime. We're going to turn it over in 30 days. You decide what you want to do. That's real leverage. We're not using it. The fourth thing we could do is to plan very transparently, start to plan for specific military operations that might make a difference on the ground if the situation deteriorates. That requires multilateral planning. And it can't just be a no-fly zone. Let me tell you right now. People keep talking about imposing a no-fly zone. It is the height of irresponsibility if we press forward with implementing a no-fly zone, which is the easiest thing in the world to do is send an airplane over and shoot a, uh, an airplane on, on, the, on the tarmac that might or might not have been involved in an offensive operation. Well, if Khartoum believes that's all we got, that's all we're prepared to do, the first thing they're going to do is cut off humanitarian assistance to four million people, and then it's on us. And if we haven't done the appropriate preparation for ground deployment, let's not go down the road, an irresponsible road, of, of inciting further, further action on the part of Khartoum. So what I'm saying is accelerated military planning multilaterally through NATO and the United Nations Security Council that looks both at air and ground involvement on, in Darfur if the situation deteriorates. Just that credible, transparent planning will give leverage to the negotiators for the peace and protection that people need in Darfur. Fifth and finally, in the point of this hearing, we have an unbelievable golden opportunity that is being squandered with each passing 24 hours. There is a confluence of three unique factors internationally that I think could help end the, the war and bring peace to Darfur uh, in, in the immediate sense. First, the United States government has, in fact, turned. The worm has turned. The U.S., through Plan B, even though it's inadequate, even though it's too unilateral, the U.S. has made a decision. We've got to start working and imposing a cost and doing what we have to do to get this, uh, this, this uh, crisis concluded. So the U.S. is in the right place. The French have just elected a new president willing to work with the United States and who want to resolve the crisis in Darfur. The French have a huge investment oil investment in Sudan, and they have the most leverage of any outside power with the rebels because they're the main backer of Chad, where most of the rebels are, are located. Thirdly, and everybody's talked about it, China. You have the first time this regime has opened, up, opened itself up because it has a vested interest in presenting a new face to the world in the context of the Olympics. It's vulnerable to pressure, and it wants to end this crisis simply because it wants it off its back. Doesn't, we don't care, frankly, what their motivations are, but they have that motivation now. We now have the three countries, France, the United States, and China, with the most leverage in Sudan, both governments and rebels. All three now, as of yesterday, the French just named their own special envoys. There's three envoys. The Chinese, French, and the U.S. have special envoys to work this issue. Why are we not working together? Why are, not, are we not hearing that these guys are getting together and they're going to start a, a major diplomatic initiative to get a peace deal and to get a protection force into Darfur immediately. Historians are going to look back at this perfect diplomatic storm and say either one of two things. Boy, they missed a huge opportunity. Or, see, that was the turning point, and they seized it. All three of these countries have a vested interest now, China, France, and the United States, have a vested interest in peace and stability in Sudan, for whatever reason, and that's both the so south, where all the, most of the oil is, and in the west, in Darfur, because we still have an unfinished agenda in implementing the north-south peace deal. So there is a solution. 
basically is the message. There is a solution to the crisis, to the, to the Darfur crisis. And for the sake of the 2.5 million survivors in Darfur, we must seize this opportunity now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pettigast. Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Shays, members of the committee for inviting me to testify today on Darfur, China, the Olympics, and what more U.S. diplomacy is needed to end this genocide. With your permission, I'll submit the full text of the statement for the record. And let me just say it's a special privilege for me to testify today, just after the House passed Resolution 422 calling on China to leverage its influence to end the genocide. My name is Larry Rossing, and I am the senior coordin international coordinator for the Save Darfur Coalition. We have over 180 organizations which together have worked for three years now to end the genocide. Our coalition has joined with other organizations and concerned citizens in building awareness and determination that action should be taken to end the genocide. And the presence here today of the founders of Dollars for Darfur, who we supported, demonstrates how the tragedy has moved Americans of all ages all over our country. Attention given to Darfur in the presidential debates recently indicates how much our efforts and those of colleagues like Joey and John and Jill Savitt, who will speak after me, uh, have made the genocide a political priority in our country. The President's decision to tighten sanctions on Sudan's regime showed that Darfur is accepted as a human rights challenge demanding an American response. And we also welcome action proposals by the new French leadership, with whom I met last week in Paris, demonstrating growing global engagement that we work with foreign partners to foster. But sadly, Mr. Chairman, all that work has really made very little difference for the people of Darfur. President al-Bashir continues his scorched earth campaign against those people with complete impunity. That the campaign continues is inarguable. Just a week ago, 1,500 women and children finished a 125-mile trek to the Central African Republic reporting that they had, had to flee continued bombing of their villages. Civil society can educate and agitate, but it's governments that have to act. We've seen too many tough words, but too few tough actions against that regime. There have been too many envoys to Khartoum with too little coordination, too many threats, too little done to make those threats real. The recent Plan B announcement by the administration of sanctions against the regime is somewhat encouraging, but it's not likely to end the genocide. President al-Bashir and his regime long since have figured out how to bleed off these kind of modest pressures. They manipulate advocates for more time for diplomacy, people like most recently the Secretary General of the UN, so they can continue their murder and mayhem. And Khartoum's only going to end this genocide under serious pressure. It clearly wants to keep doing what it's doing and calculates that murder, as John said, costs it nothing. Changing that calculation requires much tougher measures by every member of the international community with influence to wield the United States, that means Europe, it means the Arab League, it means Africa, and it also means an awful lot more from China. China is an emerging world power and it has massive economic, military, and political relationship with Sudan and with all of Africa. As you know, Mr. Chairman, China is Sudan's major investor, especially in the oil industry, and its biggest export market, and Sudan's one of China's biggest trading partners in Africa. Seventy percent of Sudan's oil revenues, according to a former minister of finance there, fund its military as it wages war against Darfur's people, working closely with the Janjaweed militia. China also provides major aid to Sudan, and when President Hu Jintao visited Khartoum in February, China wrote off $80 million of Sudanese debt and provided an interest-free $13 million loan for infrastructure, including a new presidential palace. Military ties are closer than ever, and in April, when China's defense minister received Sudan's armed forces chief in Beijing, he expressed China's willingness, quote, to further develop cooperation between the two militaries in every sphere. China maintains this military relationship despite a U.N. arms embargo in place since 2005, and the U.N.'s own panel of experts have reported that Chinese weapons, aircraft, trucks were being used by Sudan's armed forces and the Janjaweed to kill people in Darfur. Beijing defends these sales as legal, but Amnesty International has documented convincingly that they violate the U.N. embargo. Finally, as you've noted, Mr. Chairman, China has been a big diplomatic defender of Sudan, watering down one resolution after another in the United Nations, most recently the resolution that set up the UN peacekeeping force. 
This uh, behavior, uh, this support for the al-Bashir regime has not gone unnoticed among civil society internationally. And under this growing scrutiny, the Chinese have tried to portray themselves as engaged, quiet diplomacy, public statements, to get Khartoum to accept UN peacekeepers and to end the genocide in Darfur. This began in November 2006 at Addis Ababa negotiations where the hybrid peacekeeping force deal was supposedly reached. And in February, President Hu raised Darfur briefly with President Bashir in Khartoum. More recently, Chinese diplomatic envoys claimed to have reinforced that message. China's committed 275 troops. It's named a special envoy. All these things supposed to be indicating increased engagement, although the envoy, when he was in Darfur two weeks ago, echoed official Sudanese word that all is well and everything's fine in Darfur for the displaced. On balance, it's our assessment that China's performance falls unacceptably short. Whatever quiet influence China may be bringing to bear is at best ambiguous, undermined by simultaneous debt write-offs, new presidential palaces, growing military cooperation, and assertions that everything's hunky-dory out there in Darfur. No wonder al-Bashir told the Middle Eastern Wire Service after President Hu left Sudan that he hadn't felt like he was under any pressure. But we are convinced that China has real influence to wield. China claims that it was their assistant foreign minister, Zhai Jun, who, when he visited Khartoum a couple of months ago, uh, persuaded Sudan to accept the UN heavy support package to phase two of the hybrid force, and we believe that. And we would ask, if one mid-ranking Chinese official can get Khartoum to reverse six months of rejection of that force, what more could China achieve if it really leveraged its relationships to end the genocide? Recently, China's been expressing loud concern at agitation by civil society about the Olympics and about its negative role. As you noted, the uh, slogan of the Olympics is one world and one dream. Well, I can promise this, there's more of that coming. China's extremely well placed to extract agreement from Sudan for the peacekeepers and for an inclusive peace process and basically to stop killing its own people. And that has not yet happened. And until it does, international outrage will mount at China's complicity. We ourselves have met with the Chinese and told them directly that whether the Olympics-related campaign swells or not is entirely in their hands. Civil society pressure will sharpen unless China visibly helps to end the genocide. How, how can it be that the Darfur nightmare would not intrude into this Beijing dream? We've suggested to the Chinese several measures that would show real seriousness, including acknowledging publicly and condemning, which they've never done, the mass killings, torture, rape, and displacement in Darfur, affirming, as everybody else but them has done, that Sudan's government bears overwhelming responsibility for this devastation, warning that it won't accept President al-Bashir's continued obstruction of UN peacekeepers and visibly acting to end it, warning also that it won't accept Sudanese government obstruction of a renewed and inclusive peace process and visibly acting to end that obstruction signaling that it will support, not abstain on, but support a Security Council resolution enacting targeted sanctions, absent immediate demonstrable Sudanese government compliance with international obligations, redirecting that money for the new presidential palace to help the people of Darfur, and suspending military cooperation with Sudan until that conflict is ended. Mr. Chairman, this list is surely not exhaustive. It's not up to us. China will know what more it can do to end this genocide. Real Chinese engagement is an extremely valuable goal. It's worth great exertion to obtain it, and lives depend on that. But that said, active Chinese engagement will not prove decisive unless integrated in a coherent, muscular, international diplomacy that backs united messages to Khartoum with pressure measures. We share your frustration about poor U.S. and international diplomacy during the last four years. Just in the last year, we've seen four different U.S. government officials be the lead on Darfur. Is it Deputy Secretary Zelig? Is it Deputy Secretary Negroponte? Is it Assistant Secretary Frazier? Maybe, maybe it's Special Envoy Natsios. We don't know. We can't tell. And that U.S. lack of coherence has been reflected internationally. Part-time diplomacy of this sort will not change Khartoum's cold calculations. The parade of uncoordinated envoys to Khartoum really has to end now. The last four years are a graveyard of failed persuasive diplomacy as much as they are of 400,000 Darfurians. We would therefore recommend that this subcommittee uh, exercise its oversight responsibility 
generally to get more U.S. action on Darfur, and John mentioned many of the ways that that can be done, and specifically by urging the administration to support the recent French initiative to convene an enlarged contact group of all the countries with specific influence in Khartoum, including China. Only such concerted, structured global diplomacy accompanied by real pressure will change Khartoum's calculations. Without promoting such structured international collaboration, how can our government really expect to obtain mandatory Security Council sanctions? It's a big uphill climb. Without structured international collaboration, the President's Plan B sanctions will just inscribe themselves on a four-year-long list of showy gestures towards Khartoum taken while villages burned, women were raped, people were murdered, that is, while Darfur's genocide has proceeded unchecked. China can and must do more to end Darfur's agony. So must the entire international community acting together. That's another job this administration has to take in hand, and we urge your subcommittee to press the administration to do so. I look forward to your questions, and thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Ms. Savage, you've been incredibly patient. Being in the end is not easy, and, and we respect that. Well, we've run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, thank you so much for holding this hearing, uh, Chairman Tierney, and, and for inviting me to participate. I want to associate myself with the comments of all of my colleagues here on the panel, and I won't go over some of the same ground that they've covered. Um, we've, we've articulated that Darfur is a huge crisis. Your holding this hearing shows that you understand the strategic importance that China can play right now in this fortuitous moment of having a close strategic and economic partner of Su the Sudanese government being the host of the Olympics. Um, so the question today is what might be done to pressure China? What are all the tools at our disposal? I want to tell you about a new campaign that I am um, that it's called the Olympic Dream for Darfur that has just launched. It's part of the broader Darfur advocacy community, and it's one very concrete way that we want to use the Olympics as a point of leverage to convince China to cause Khartoum to consent to um, a real UN protection force and to engage in a peace process. Um, what we're doing is um, launching a symbolic Olympic torch relay that will go from Darfur to Beijing. We're starting this in August, August 8th, which is a year from the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, and we're going to go through countries historically associated with genocide and mass slaughter. We're starting in Chad. We have um, the great Darfur advocate Mia Farrow is going to, and others have been invited, and we, we welcome anyone who would like to join us on this trip, members of this subcommittee, if there's any leg of this relay, it's something to train for. I was going to say what I have to train with Ms. Lupe. <laughs> if there's any leg of this trip that you would like to join us on, you would be most welcome if it fits your schedule. We're starting as close to Darfur as we can get, so likely in Chad. We're going then to Rwanda, Armenia, Sarajevo. We're going to Germany. We're going to uh, Cambodia, and we'll likely end in Hong Kong. I'm not sure the Chinese will welcome us in, but we're going to try. And when we're in Hong Kong, we're going to talk about the rape of Nanjing to highlight China's own history with um, the killing of civilians. Um, we're also going to hold with our, with our colleagues here, many of whom are in this room, a symbolic torch relay here in the United States to show solidarity with that global relay. Oh, one point I want to mention, it turns out that at the genocide memorials in a lot of those countries, they have an eternal flame. And so we have now just gotten our torch, and it looks very much like a torch that the Janjaweed uses to torch these villages as symbolic. And we're going to light that torch from those eternal flames, just as a, a way to show you how we want to put pressure on China. Um, our message is, China, please bring the Olympic dream to Darfur. I, I want to especially underline the comments of the athletes who have spoken and say we do not support a boycott of the Olympics. Um, we do believe in this Olympic ideal and the idea that countries, we want to live in a world where countries do battle in sporting arenas and where the Olympic Games are where countries send young men and women to show their patriotism and their physical prowess. Um, so that is a very important point. Um, so the question then is, what can be done? 
I, I'm hoping that if people feel energized and moved by the things they've heard today, they will join us in our relay, if I may. Dreamfordarfor.org is how you can get involved. Sorry. Dreamfordarfor.org. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's F O R, not the numeral. Dreamfordarfor.org. Thank you. Um, the, the, there are a couple things that I, I do want to make clear that, th about what we can all do together. They're, the people we're mobilizing on this relay, they are right now writing emails, getting ready for rallies. Um, writing letters to the International Olympic Committee, to the Olympic corporate sponsors, to the some 200 national Olympic committees, to the UN, which has a role to play in, in international sporting. And they are asking all of those bodies to intercede with the Olympic host. And I want to be clear, as um, Ambassador Rawson said, that China has taken many steps since we've started this effort, since our community has been doing divestment and placing ads and making ourselves heard. Um, it is, of course, welcome, but not nearly sufficient. We want to say that there needs to be, that there's only one outcome that China must secure from Khartoum, and that is adequate and verifiable security for civilians in Darfur. Not an envoy, not just 275 engineers, not statements, but adequate and verifiable security for, those in, for civilians in Darfur. And, and we would like you to urge, if you are able, that if Khartoum doesn't comply with China on that, that China then, then takes action, that it doesn't provide the interest-free loan for a new presidential palace, that it doesn't forgive up to $80 million in Sudan's debt, that it really has consequences if um, Sudan does not consent to allowing a true protection force into Darfur. Um, we're hoping that we can create some space for policymakers to act if there are ways members of Congress and members of this subcommittee can approach the Olympic sponsors, can approach the International Olympic Committee and say that they do not want the Olympics tarnished by genocide, that the Olympic host cannot be complicit in an ongoing genocide, because we are really racing with the clock, as we all well know. The survivalist regime in Khartoum is prepared to do all that is necessary to ensure the success of its genocidal counterinsurgency. And if we don't act now, this robust civilian protection force is going to be moot, because there will be just far, far fewer people in Darfur to protect. So as a body, and thank you for holding this hearing, please insist that China exert its leadership immediately to bring the Olympic dream to Darfur. Thank you so much for holding this hearing. Thank you very much. Thank all of the witnesses. Now, those noises that you heard and, uh, and so rudely interrupted you mean that we have votes. Um, members up here are very interested in asking questions. I don't know what your schedules are, but if you can stay, uh, we'd like to go and vote and come back and maybe let you have an early lunch or at least a little respite here until about 12:15 uh, or 12:20. Is that good with everybody, or, or was it uh, ruin your day, John? <laughs> it looks like we're ruining your day. Uh, right, we'll be two votes, so we, we might be back sooner than that. We could be back even before noontime, whatever. If you want to try that, we can do that. Is any member here not been able to return and want to ask a couple quick questions now? Right. I'll Brian. hold my question, Mr. Chairman, but I, yeah, I'll try to meet that okay, schedule. Great. All right. Then why don't we come back at noontime? All right, we'll try to be back here at noon, and then uh, we'll have the questioning and hopefully let you go before Captain very long after that. Down one floor. Okay. All right. Thank you all very, very much. You guys are a nice, nice subcommittee. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you very much. I'll thank you all for your patience. We're going to reconvene the meeting now. I hope you all got a little sustenance uh, in the break. Uh, what we're going to do is, is probably, instead of taking five minutes each for question, maybe open it up to ten and uh, have a round of questioning and then see where we are at that point. I don't think there's any need to start slamming the uh, gavel down on people uh, if we're really getting some good information. I'm going to take the uh, liberty of, of starting here and then we'll, we'll move on from there. 
I, I want to ask a general question, and, and I, I suppose that Mr. Pendergrast and, uh, and the Ambassador might certainly have a, a view on this, but if anybody else does, I'd like to hear it as well. What are we doing with regard to sponsors of the Olympics? We've talked about China and, and the need to engage and focus it around uh, their idea of, of sponsoring this. What about the Coca-Colas and the General Electrics and um, NBC and, and others who are uh, going to profit considerably out of this? Is there a way to get them engaged in trying to work the international community, trying to pressure the inter international community to heighten its awareness or to start working, say, in a contact group like uh, the Ambassador recommended? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm only going to talk about this very. Is that I did, I did the right thing? Fantastic. <laughs> I knew I was here for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. You really do have to put it up close. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to just speak really briefly. I think actually Jill is the person who can best respond to the question that you've raised. Um, we believe that uh, that in the Olympics area, like in the more general area of those with influence bringing pressure in order to end the genocide, that sponsoring companies for the Olympics have a role to play. Uh, you'll recall that um, a lot of the buzz about the Olympic linkage, about the genocide Olympics, began when Mia Farrow wrote her column in the Wall Street Journal that didn't flag China per se. It actually was a column that was directed at Steven Spielberg, because Steven Spielberg is, in a way, one of the corporate sponsors, or he's a, a communications advisor to the, uh, to the Olympics. <clears throat> and, that, and that Mia Farrow not only Mia Farrow's column and all the consciousness that that raised uh, were val was valuable in and of itself, but it also was valuable in two other ways. One is it, it, it's, it smoked out the Chinese in a sense. They reacted very, very strongly to it. Uh, and I think they, uh, they drew more attention to this, the opportunity that, that the Olympics present for bringing pressure on China to uh, use its influence uh, in, uh, with Khartoum 10, the genocide. I think the second thing uh, was the uh, reaction of Mr. Spielberg himself, uh, who then wrote a letter to President Hu Jintao. I'm not sure he was that aware of what was going on in Darfur. He was quickly educated. Uh, he wrote a letter to President Hu Jintao, and now is engaging very actively, and I think will become part of the, uh, uh, this campaign in a way that will make a huge difference. The, the, the kind of attention celebrity can bring is always very valuable in these campaigns. Um, I'll let Jill talk a little bit, I think, sure. about corporate sponsors, because that's part of her effort. Yeah. Our uh, Olympic Dream for Darfur campaign is working with the entire community, and we have colleagues who have shown a great deal of success in the divestment community helping to craft this strategy aimed at corporate sponsors of the Olympics. I think our, our first order of business is to give the corporate sponsors an opportunity to do the right thing and to educate them about the, the linkage between China, Darfur, and the Olympics, and, um, and approach them. So we're approaching them in a couple of ways. One is through the socially responsible investor community, pension funds and the like, who will go to the corporate sponsors and say, we're very concerned, this, the corporate social responsibility business community, um, we're very concerned about your association with this. We want to educate you and, and approach them. We're going to approach them directly and ask them to take one of two first initial steps, which is to write a letter to um, the International Olympic Committee and to the President of China, and also to make a public statement of concern. Those are the first two things that we'd like. We think they're very modest. And our goal is to get at least one corporate sponsor to become a leader and hopefully then have a domino effect with some other corporate sponsors. As part of that strategy, I think there's a huge role to play for others who can intercede with these corporations and sit down with them and educate them about the fact that what they are endorsing by sponsoring the Olympics, what they are underwriting and whose image they are burnishing um, as the games near. Again, if we're not going to boycott ourselves, we're not going to urge other people to boycott or withdraw. In fact, once you boycott it as a strategic matter, you lose your leverage. And so as long as the sponsors are um, donating money and being able to intercede with the Chinese government, we want them to use that. And even as the Olympics near, ask them for more and more things like seeding some of their advertising time to educate more people about Darfur and giving some of the, uh, dividing up or giving equal funds to the cause of Darfur that they're giving to the Olympics. And even underwriting, corporate sponsorship will take of our Olympic torch relay if they were so inclined. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hari, 
Uh, there were three names that Mr. Pendergast mentioned uh, in his testimony, and uh, I was wondering about your opinion over the effectiveness of, of listing those three individuals as uh, people that are targeted for sanctions uh, and possibly targeted for uh, information about their activities to be shared with the international uh, court. Would you comment on that? Yeah, um, uh, I think it's very fantastic that I will hear this name uh, from John, uh, Mr. Frank, that's like, it's not three, but there's a lot of people who have uh, activities in Khartoum, there's again, it's, um, uh, the Darfurian people, and we know even Musa Hilal, who were very famous uh, Janjaweed leaders. He was, he was a village, perhaps like a uh, general from the government, and, uh, they give the, just only, they, they call the general Musa Hilal. So there's a lot of people, yeah, uh, you know, are uh, associated with the genocide and uh, what we tell. Is, is there, to your knowledge, any group of people in the political uh, class in Sudan who are likely to be sympathetic to doing something positive on this issue that just we're not hearing about because uh, they don't have a forum or they're uh, afraid to speak out, or do you think it's a pretty monolithic uh, group that is intent on just following the lead of uh, Mr. al-Bashir? I don't, I don't, I didn't hear any, when politician of Sudan uh, is talking about the stop of the genocide in Darfur because uh, the regime, they were all following for the regimes, even the parliament, and you know uh, how the government controlled the re his the members of. Uh, uh, I don't think some someone from the politician of Sudan they going to. Uh, recently, like uh, the southern the leaders who were uh, uh, they were associated with government is very recently, but they have a lot of sin. They, they were concerned about. They will not talk. Uh, I suppose we 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 need to hear from uh, like the southern leader to push government that except you know uh, the UN troops in in Darfur, but unfortunately he don't he don't ask the government and he don't push government that to accept. Uh, just they will keep silent. Thank you. Mr. Yes, Mr. Pedigas. Thanks for the opportunity, Congressman. Um, you know this regime took power in a military coup in 1989. Um, they, they have a very small, small base of support. Uh, they maintain power by any means necessary. If it takes genocide to put down a rebellion in Darfur, they do that. They waged a, one of the most brutal counterinsurgency campaigns the world has ever seen in southern Sudan for many years, where we talked about earlier, especially the slave raiding and things that went on there. And they brutally suppress all rights uh, political opposition. So the question is really an interesting one. You know, would there be elements and citizens in Sudan who, if we sided with the Sudanese people in a, in a very clear way, what would be the reaction? And I think it would be very, very positive. I think if we were smarter in our public diplomacy and smarter in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, trying to invest for the long run in a relationship with Sudan and the Sudanese people, it would make all the difference in the world. So picking out and, and being very clear that it's just a few of these individuals who have held on to power using military means and using all the kinds of counterinsurgency tactics that they've learned from centuries, literally, of history, um, that's the reason they've, maintained, they've stayed in power. But there's all these aspirations. Sudan had a huge uh, and vibrant political culture and civil society culture before these guys came to power in 1989 and just crushed it. But it's there. It's still there under, under the radar screen. And the more that we can invest in building long-term relationships with the people, I think, and our humanitarian aid does that in part. I mean, that's an important element to say that we care about the suffering of the people. But we could do a lot more with respect to building the political and supporting the political and uh, social aspirations of the people as, as much as just their basic human, human needs. Having worked in that area in the past administration, do you think that we've 
on a diplomatic side identify these people and are reaching out through back channels or any other method, uh, method? you think we're just ignoring that avenue right now? You know, it's funny because, not, no, not at all. Um, you know, in, in these kinds of situations, you know, people like me who are hardliners who say, you know, we got to use the tools, the punitive measures, people think that, you know, we, we think, ah, oh, then you cut off communication. I think the opposite. When you ramp up a pressure, a policy of multilateral pressure, you should also ramp up your political engagement. We should be engaging not just with the government, but with all kinds of the political parties that are uh, above and underground and all these civil society organizations. We should increase our diplomatic presence in Khartoum rather substantially because it is an important country, both in the world and in our foreign policy, and we have a lot of interest there. And we're badly served. We don't have an ambassador. We don't have a, 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 a few, just but a few uh, political officers. There's just not enough to do the kind of real engagement to demonstrate to people a real public diplomacy strategy to demonstrate to the Sudanese people that it matters to us what happens to them and that we want the best for the country. We want to support their democratic aspirations, not our vision of it. It's their own, and we want to support peace and stability in the country in the long term. Thank you. And uh, I'll just wrap up my question with uh, Mr. Cheek and Ms. Lupe. Uh, we talked a little bit uh, before the hearing, and we just share on the record uh, what efforts you are making to engage uh, athletes uh, in this prospect that you've been talking about here this morning. Well, again, with the, with the founding of this organization that I, I sort of put forth this Where Would Be campaign, uh, the goal ultimately, and we're, we're sort of in the initial stages, we're getting incorporated and in, in nonprofit status and we've got office space donated to us. What we hope is that we can organize an international campaign. Uh, maybe, you know, because I, I'm one of the driving forces, obviously it's going to be seen a bit as a U.S.-centric thing, but ultimately, ultimately my goal is that it's not primarily U.S. athletes, but majority athletes representing other nations. Because to a certain extent, um, anything in some areas, anything led by the U.S. will be met with certain suspect. And so I think that having a, a truly uh, a multilateral international voice, especially of athletes competing in this, uh, it's very easy to say, uh, you know, Joe, you're done. You're not competing in this games. You can say whatever you want because there's no real uh, consequence to you. Uh, it's much harder if uh, athletes, and these are, are friends and, and <laughs> new friends uh, that, I'm, that I'm reaching out to from all over Asia, Europe, and Africa, South America, uh, if they're competing and they're saying the same things, then it's very difficult to accuse them of, of taking a, a course that's you know, politically easy, I suppose. Tegel? Ms. Lupe? Uh, I think I have the same idea also uh, with Joey. Uh, in Kenya, we have uh, uh, some uh, peace races that we organize and we we talk about the problem in Darfur and that's the only thing that you can make other people understand. It's not that you have a, it's difficult to ask somebody but from sports there will be some good athletes that we are using them as a role model. Uh, next week, uh, in two weeks, we will be having a peace race in Uganda whereby uh, we recruited also uh, members of parliament in Kenya, and we have six ministers that they have confirmed. And I'm really proud that also the government are joining this uh, uh, policy. And there will be representative from your government in Sudan. Um, ambassador talked to me that he will send also one person to Uganda, and the address will be in Moroto, Uganda. The Minister also for Sports in Uganda and Education will be joining us. So this is the, the theme that we are going to start somewhere. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Thank you. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding these hearings. And uh, to our witnesses, um, each one of you uh, has provided a wonderful insight into this issue. And there, each of you have different perspectives. So every one of you was necessary to I think for, this, um, for us to have this kind of meaningful dialogue and to learn from you. I, um, I just want to be uh, clear with you, Mr. Cheek, uh, in terms of you're not recommending we boycott the Olympics. What you're recommending is that we use the Olympics in an effective way with American athletes and other athletes around the world, uh, making sure that we speak out uh, now and during the Olympics about this issue. Is that uh, what I'm, yeah. Correct. I am, I'm 
strongly against any kind of boycott of the Olympic right. Games. And, and Ms. Sabat, you, you, you've taken that same position. Exactly. Well, I'm just reminded one time when I was really angry uh, what happened in the State House of Representatives about a process. The entire Republican delegation uh, <coughs> members walked out, and we just watched uh, our other colleagues stay on the House floor and continue to debate the bill, <laughs> minus our input. Yeah. And I have to tell you, it was the stupidest thing we ever did. Well, we've done a lot of stupid things in our life. <laughs> that ranks as one that I haven't forgotten. Um, and so I'm really grateful uh, that you are saying, go there, but do not be silent about the issue. And wouldn't it be nice that you could go and thank uh, this Chinese government for responding before? In other words, let's not assume that, that it's going to you know, be like this by the time the Olympics. Let's assume that we can all have some impact. I, um, I want to say to you, uh, Mr. Hari, um, you are a brave heart. And you, uh, uh, I am stunned by the fact that you were willing to go into northern Darfur, given uh, all the threats that may have uh, come your way uh, and, and ultimately did by your arrest with Mr. Salopak. I, I want you to know when we met with Mr. Salopak in, in the prison, uh, he was concerned about himself, but he was more concerned about you. He was more concerned about you. He, he insisted that you be treated better. He insisted that we, Americans, uh, focus on your plight. Uh, he was grateful that we were focusing on his, but um, I think you know it, but I just want to say it for the public record. You have a wonderful friend in Mr. Salopak. And you have a lot of friends here, and you have a lot of admirers. And you're not a difficult person to help because you are a brave heart. And you represent a lot of other brave hearts. I, um, I am going to tell all of you that I think that this administration gets a bit of a bad rap. Um, I think that we have spent a ton of money we have called this a genocide where no other country is willing to do it. We are constantly being criticized by other countries for calling it that. Uh, we have a special envoy. We have an ambassador, frankly, who dedicates 99% of his time to this effort. And uh, we have American uh, NGOs that are getting f significant resources to feed uh, uh, individuals who have now are in these camps. I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer. When I went to visit one of the camps in northern Darfur, I was struck by the fact that there was food and there was education. And I looked at some of the villages around these camps and I thought, you know, I don't know if I'd rather be in the villages around the camps or I'd rather be in the camps. Now, um, obviously I wasn't in the villages, so I can't form a, a firm opinion. Uh, what I was struck with was how there has been some real effort on the NGO side of the equation. And a lot of people are risking their lives uh, because they know if the United States just does something that this government doesn't like, uh, their lives can be threatened. I did not have one NGO that thought we should send military there. They said, you send military there, we're dead men walking. Well, really what they said is we'll have to leave and we're not sure we'll be able to get out safely. Um, that was one point that was made, and, and we traveled together in this. So your observations may be slightly different. Um, but, um, and I, I, am, I am somewhat, and I use this word um, as infrequently as it can because I do not like to think that I have this mentality, but I am somewhat frustrated by uh, people who suggest that we got to get other countries to do what we want through negotiations, and when they don't do, what we think they should, it's our fault. Um, because it isn't our fault. Uh, there are a lot of countries here who are doing far less and could be doing far more, and they're getting a pass. Um, so uh, I know we can't send military troops. I suggested, and I'll, I'll make this point to you, and then I'm just kind of saying this so I can then just ask each of you for your reaction. When we were talking to the, the governor of northern Darfur, and we were talking about how outrageous it was that you had, uh, you had cattlemen killing farmers uh, with weapons and on large animals with farmers who had no weapons who looked in a, were in a very vulnerable position. 
And it was almost like, you know, yes, this is happening and it's wrong and so on. And then I said, you know, what I think we should do is we should at least begin by having a no-fly zone. And at that moment, the, the governor of, of Northern Darfur became outraged, incensed, and said, how dare you, um, you know, in, in, impugn our country, how dare you impose on our sovereignty. Then he was outraged. He was outraged about the sovereignty, not outraged by the death of his own country, men, women, and children. And uh, I thought, this is one tough group of people. And so I'm, I, I say this now, I'd like reaction. Uh, and I, I'd like uh, you uh, to start off, uh, Mr. Harry, and we'll go right up the line. Actually, I'd like to go to you in this, uh, Rupe, uh, and then uh, to, to you, uh, Mr. Pendergast and Mr. Rossin, because I've already engaged. React to what I've said. Tell me what you would specifically like the, our country to do that we're not doing. And tell me why, if we did it, it would make a difference. And if you'd like someone else to go first, I could do that. Mr. Pentegas, you're the most aggressive on this. Let's, let's start <laughs> out with you. You can count on me for aggressiveness. Um, the U.S. is indeed doing more than any other country in the world. And indeed, the her humanitarian relief effort has been nothing short of Herculean. Um, what you pay, may not have uh, been briefed on fully because of, you know, it's, it's the way you do the numbers, is we have now over one million people in Darfur, according to the United Nations, not according to us right. aggressive activists, that are outside of the reach of humanitarian assistance. You mean they're not in the camps? They do not, in, not well, many of them are in camps, but the, because of targeted violence and because of bureaucratic restrictions on, imposed by the government of Sudan, both of these two factors, people in, largely in camps, 98% of those are in camps, are not being reached by our humanitarian aid infrastructure. One million people. So whereas the people that are being served now in very, very difficult circumstances, you know, people braving, uh, risking their lives often to provide that assistance, 90% of the assistance being provided, of course, by Sudanese themselves, um, we don't have any idea what's going on in those areas where a million people are not being reached. We don't know what their mortality rates are, we, so you get the picture. So yes, there have been a lot has been expended, but wow, okay. we've got a long way to Fair go. Enough. Number two, U.S. action has been by far and away larger than any other country. But as I said, and I, and I think it's a really important point, it's been unilateral. And we have to work, and we have to work assiduously, multilaterally, which is a lot harder. I mean, it's just a lot more work right now. And we need to save our leverage, understandably, for Iraq and Afghanistan and North Korea and Iran. And we only have so much. And so, I, again, I've worked in the last one, and we had to do this horse trading every day up in New York. And you make your calculations, where do we want to expend our energy, and where are we just going to basically do things for public relations purposes? And I fear that Darfur gets, although first-tier rhetoric, it kind of falls down into second-tier uh, uh, expenditures. Let me ask you this question. If we don't have success multilaterally, isn't our only other choice to act unilaterally? But we haven't tried multilaterally. That's my point. I don't, the point of going from zero to 60 in, with military measures and with unilateral measures, when, when there are things that have been proven over time, three, as we said, the three cases, three times we've actually changed government of Sudan policy during the last 18 years, when we worked very assiduously through the United Nations, both administrations, Clinton well, and Well, you say last 18 years, some of those things you mentioned happened in the last year or two, didn't they? It, the, the most important example, indeed, was the peace process brokered by the Bush administration, the peace agreement between the North yeah. and the South. Well, that was acting multilaterally. Acting multilaterally. So we have tried. I mean, I'm not trying to debate you other than no. to just make sure the record's clear. But, but I, I definitely refer to that in the testimony, R wrote about it. I think it's the most right. important right. case study. In other words, we have a model. We just need to reintroduce the model. No, but I would suggest to you that we are doing things that don't show up in people's radar screens multilaterally. We are putting incredible pressure on our, our allies in Europe. At the same time, we're putting pressure on them with Iran. Uh, and it's not, in my judgment, I think there are things that are happening that nobody's going to give this administration credit for. 
Um, and, and true, true of all administrations, we never get the credit we need. But there are two things I think that are that need to be visible. And the first one is that we need to, through the United Nations Security Council, get a resolution that does impose a cost. Let's look at the Genocide Convention. You read it upside down, inside out. The only operative phrase in the entire convention is that signatory states must do all they can to prevent, way too late for that, or to punish the crime of genocide. We haven't punished it, and we have to punish it multilaterally because the Sudanese discount unilateral action. And the second thing we need to do with our special envoy, as of yesterday, the new French special envoy and the Chinese special envoy, we need to make a visible diplomatic push by the three countries that have leverage. That hasn't happened yet. It can be in the context of a contact group, as the ambassador said, or whatever the, the context. Yeah. But we have to be visibly working with them because I believe, as every one of us has said, the Chinese are a big question mark, and they can be engaged. It's in their national security interest to have stability in Sudan. So we actually share a common goal. It's not like we're trying to fight them to do something they don't want to do. It's just how they do it is going to be completely different than how we do it. They will never criticize this government. They'll never do anything in Khartoum. They'll never say anything that broaches sovereignty. But behind the scenes, I believe they can be engaged to do a lot more than they're doing With now. With the chairman's indulgence, could I go to the ambassador and our two African friends? Uh, ambassador. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Congressman Shays. Um, our organization has certainly uh, uh, put a lot of pressure on the administration and on President Bush uh, through our advertising and through other work that we've done. And I think that has impact. Uh, it does have impact uh, in our assessment as well, and thank you very much for affirming that. Uh, but I want to underscore something. We don't question the President's uh, genuine, sincere concern about the situation in Darfur, nor the, the efforts of the, the, the will of the uh, gov of our government and our administration to try and make a difference and to end the, end the genocide that it itself, as you, as you pointed out, had named in Darfur. But we do have a concern, and when we've talked to uh, officials of the uh, administration, the concern is reinforced. Um, there's a dynamic, particularly with, uh, there are things like Iraq and Afghanistan uh, uh, that are always, at, uh, North Korea, that are always at the very top level of diplomatic attention. They don't need to be pushed. They're always out there and assistant. Uh, things like Darfur, like Kosovo, and other Balkan positions in the 1990s, like Haiti, uh, tend to have to be pushed, tend to have to be pulled by interested right. uh, officials in the administration in, to a place where they get all of the attention and, in, in a sense, the whole toolbox of and, U.S. And, and what that argues for is that you uh, state the, the case in as extreme a way as you can state it. In other words, you shouldn't be the moderating force in the middle. You need to be pushing for You need one. to be pushing it. You I need agree to with that. be pushing. Could, could I, because uh, I, I, I'm monopolizing time here, I'd love to speak to our, our two uh, um, witnesses from Africa. Ms. LaRupe? LaRupe? Do you have a comment on that? I'd like to just know, what would you like, give me one or two things specifically you'd like our government to do, and I'm going to qualify it by saying, I find there is a real concern in Africa that we not act like a colonial power and that Europe doesn't act like a colonial unit. Uh, been there, done that, so I find that, that that's somewhat of a restraint on our even doing some good things. Um, but whichever of you would like to jump in first. And if you don't want to answer, you don't have to. Okay. Uh, I think what I would uh, okay, like to rep represent uh, the voices of uh, Africa. And when you mention about the, there is fear, when you, people mention about sending troops uh, to Darfur, I think it doesn't solve. I think the only thing that your government can do is to work together with the African Union, right. not to go alone. But see, we're, I think, aren't we willing to almost fund all the African uh, costs, the United States? I mean, I, my un understanding is if they sent, instead of 7,000, 14,000, the United States would help fund most of that cost. Who are you asking that to? I'm just, to I'm, I'm asking uh, you, uh, the ambassador. Well, uh, Sorry, we, fund, uh, we fund currently, uh, sir, the uh, costs for infrastructure for the African Union force, the European Union funds the salaries and operating costs. Uh, I don't know if that, force was, if that force was enlarged, if in fact we would be willing to do it because okay. the administration has consistently sent inadequate funding requests to the Hill, and in fact it's been members of Congress. Well, then we'll leave that on the record. Thank you. Mr. Hari, if you have one, one minute, we do want to, in fairness to the other members of the committee, go on to them. Do you have any comment that you want to make on Mr. Shays' remarks? Okay. 
You do? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, uh, I'm a Darfurian. Uh, as like the other Darfurian, I need from United States to push and uh, working with the, his allies to push uh, UN Security Council to send more troops to Darfur. To you know, I, just say, but the UN includes China. That's the problem. The, the Security Council includes China. They're part of it. Is when we work in the people we're working together, they have to pressure China to stop to make uh, uh, the RQ or the resolution because uh, what I saw in, 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 in Darfur now is going now in Chad. It's something like the Eastern Chad and Eastern Central Africa is right now is going the genocide the same Darfur. Uh, this is why it's the genocide extended in Africa because of the yes, worldly community were not care about. Uh, they didn't take action in Darfur. That's why the government is used as sometimes is, you know, uh, pressure for the the NGO. Sometimes is, you know, make uh, at this. But the first of all, the Darfurian they need uh, the secure from United United States and U.S. Security Council. Thank you, Mr. Hari. Mr. Higgins, thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman John Tierney, for uh, holding this uh, hearing. I, I'm struck by the, uh, you know, the conviction and the, and the commitment of, of the panel because, you know, such an atrocity should, should justify uh, a major response from the world, uh, particularly the Western world that values the very things that are being violated uh, in Darfur at a very fundamental level. Um, but it's the non-governmental community, uh, formally and not, that has sustained uh, attention and focus uh, on this issue, which is a great tribute uh, to all of you. And I think you know, the good thing for you is that the governments are catching up. <laughs> I think that even Congress in the past six months has come a long way. And unfortunately, there's been this preoccupation with Iraq and Afghanistan and other world conflicts, although different in nature, uh, this is a world conflict that obviously requires a response and, and, and a stronger response. And at the very least, at the very least, uh, from the United States, I had traveled to the Sudan uh, with then uh, chairman, now ranking member, uh, Chris Shays, and we visited uh, Paul Selipak uh, in, in custody in, in, in the Sudan. And uh, he, as is, is Chris has said, is was most concerned about your welfare uh, than his, uh, despite the fact that there was this filthy uh, individual being held, uh, but very lucid and, and, uh, and was subsequently released, which was a very good thing. The, the other thing that struck me was uh, going into some of the, the refugee camps and the schools that were uh, being conducted by Save the Children. And despite all this misery uh, that surrounded them and this lack of optimism for a future, uh, there was a presence in these kids uh, that conveyed a tremendous sense uh, of optimism and appreciation for what they were going through. And despite our long trip and seeing some of the horrible things that were going on in Darfur, uh, you leave with a sense of optimism because you believe that in them is a potential for the triumph of the human spirit against uh, extraordinary uh, atrocities. Uh, a couple of things. You know, when you look at world conflict, wherever it exists, uh, there are fundamentals. And this one has an economic fundamental. This one has a racial fundamental, despite uh, being indistinguishable from color. Uh, there is an African population, and there is an Arab population. And the misery that's been exacted on the African population is beyond human comprehension. Um, I think when the new regime, when the current regime took control, uh, there was pervasive drought in the Sudan, which reduced the arable land and thus intensified the competition for the land, which I think created a situation uh, which was horrible. But the other thing that you realize, since the current regime has taken over, uh, the world has changed. <laughs> and I think in many <coughs> cases, you know, I think the discussion here, the theme has been uh, will or lack of will on the part of the United States, on, on the part of the Western world uh, to do something about this conflict. 
One question I have, uh, John Prendergast, for you and others, please, is, is it a lack of will or is it a loss of leverage? Um, because of the demand for oil and the precious resources that the Sudan has ab an abundance of, um, has the United States, which previously the Sudan would be much, have a much greater dependence on, have we lost leverage uh, because of that? And then I have a follow-up question. So, John, I'd like to start with you and then the other panelists, please. Thank you, Congressman. I, I also want to just say one very quick parenthetical to your very good explanation of a lot of what's happened. And that is that with respect to Arab and, and non-Arab peoples in Darfur, you know, the, the government that took power is a very small minority regime, and they've used a very small percentage of the Arab militia in Darfur, this sort of Darfur's version of the KKK, the Janjaweed, to, to undertake most of its destruction. The vast majority of Arab people in, Dar, in Sudan are horrified mm -hmm. by the actions of this small minority of people. So I just wanted, I, you weren't implying otherwise, but I wanted just to keep that on, in, in the air so that we, we understand this isn't a, an ethnic or tribal or racial issue. And it's, a, it's a power grab and, a, and a people, people maintaining power. So, and on your point about or question about lack of will versus lack of leverage, indeed, I think the U.S. Had, has less leverage. There, no one could argue we have more than we did uh, uh, pre-2003, uh, uh, pre-Iraq. We, we, are, we are constrained dramatically, in fact, multilaterally in, uh, on a number of fronts by uh, what has happened over the last three years. Nevertheless, when we have demonstrated leadership, particularly in the United Nations Security Council globally, on issues like North Korea, when, we finally, when our policy finally shifted, on Iraq, still, we still can get uh, countries to go along with some of our is that people will go along. And I wanted to make a point to, to Mr. Shea's question, uh, or, or, or point to, to answer yours, that in the last whatever number of years it's been since the Cold War ended, um, China, Russia, none of these countries have ever vetoed a Security Council resolution related to Africa. In other words, if it matters enough to us, and in fact it's in their interests, to have a resolution in, 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 uh, to the crisis. Now, they're going to stand publicly and threaten veto. They're going to stand publicly and say and, and oppose anything that violates the sovereignty of another state because they don't want their sovereignty because of what they're doing. So, however, I think we still have the leverage when we, ha when we decide to, to, to press uh, forward with enough political will to move the international community sufficiently to do, to do the work. And, it, and, and the most exciting thing about this issue has been that it's been bipartisan. And that, you know, the, the, the thing hasn't been an attack by the Democrats against the administration or whatever. It's been joint and say, we can do more. Yeah, we've lost a little bit, but we still, empirical evidence demonstrates and other issues that when we do take that leading role, we can actually move a situation on the ground fairly substantially. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, I'd like to make two comments as well. One of them was your observation, which obviously I would share and our, our entire organization would share, about the heroism of the humanitarian uh, workers in Darfur who work under really incomparable uh, threats uh, and harassment from the Sudanese government. They, the things they describe they have never encountered in other situations. And I think that underscores something about that heroism, about that bright light of the human spirit, which you described, that can give rise to optimism. And that is that all of that exists at the sufferance of the Sudanese government. They could be deciding, even now while we're sitting here, they could be deciding to kick all of those aid workers out, to do anything they want, because there is absolutely no international leverage on the ground in Darfur to control in any way what they do. The UN's been warning that that could happen. The, the uh, private NGOs have been warning that that could happen. That's why we think we need to move beyond this kind of a situation to where we can actually get some grip on, on the situation in Darfur so that the people that are living there in these camps are really not, and the humanitarian workers themselves, are not at the mercy of this government, which has no good intentions uh, in its heart. Um, with regard to the leverage issue uh, that you mentioned, I would certainly agree with uh, John and, and I think with the implication of your question as well, uh, which is that our leverage is diminished uh, compared perhaps to some other times and there's a lot of competition for, uh, for administration attention. I think the concern that we have is the leverage and the tools that we do have are, are not adequately mobilized, in fact. 
Uh, I worked on, on the Balkans for a number of years as a State Department uh, officer before I retired at the end of the last decade, beginning of this. And the kind of international, consistent, concentrated, going across the Atlantic every week, mm -hmm. going to these places that we used to do on Kosovo and on Bosnia, I, I travel uh, uh, a lot in Europe for our organization, meet with government officials, and I see no evidence of that taking place with regard to Darfur. Oftentimes, I'm the first person that's come into their office to talk about Darfur. Uh, I don't know if it's maybe embassy officers delivering, you know, Xerox uh, de Marches, as we used to do when I worked for the State Department, but there's not that kind of intensive engagement. The Darfur Peace and Accountability Act last year uh, mandated the President do certain things and authorized him to do a number of other things, such as barring the entry into U.S. ports of ships that have carried Sudanese oil. We don't understand why, in a sense, the book isn't being thrown at President Bashir. Why? dribble out a few sanctions now with Plan B, and then maybe, who knows when down the road, you dribble out more. There's just nothing in the behavior of the government of Sudan or the diplomatic process that's, that's been going on to justify really not throwing the book, not imposing all the sanctions that are available now. Um, I think the other uh, thing that I would say is that even the, the things that have been done maybe have not been adequately implemented, and I think with regard to the new sanctions that were announced by the President, it's important for this committee and for the Congress as a whole to monitor and to exercise oversight to make sure those things are actually done. They need more enforcement mechanisms. They need more resources in Treasury at the agency. And in, in April, when Andrew Natsios testified before a Senate committee, he said part of Plan B would be setting up the enforcement mechanisms not only for the new sanctions, but actually for the existing sanctions, i.e., what have they been doing with those existing sanctions over the last period? So I think this is the area where our concern is great and where there doesn't seem to be a positive evolution nearly fast enough to match the scale even of the deterioration in Darfur. Thank you. Just uh, one more question. Uh, again, you know, we talked about the United Nations, you know, does not move itself, it has to be moved by the influence. I think the irony is that after World War II, in the United States had, had, had the world at its feet. <laughs> and, uh, and established international organizations, including the United Nations and the United Nations Security Council. And as a demonstration not only of military might and economic superiority, the United States demonstrated a generous spirit by including China in the United Nations Security Council, and perhaps China should be reminded of that. But just on the, the issue of, you know, who's in control there? Al-Bashir, is, is, is he a figurehead? Because, John, you had mentioned in your earlier uh, comments that, you know, there's three individuals that you want to uh, apply pressure to uh, in, in, in Darfur. And I think it was the assistant principal, uh, pr uh, president, the director of intelligence, and the Minister of uh, Defense. Uh, why al-Bashir is, is more of a figurehead, or is it a loose coalition that requires all of these individuals? I'm not quite sure. Just elaborate, if you will. The, um, the government of Sudan, like many um, dictatorships, uh, are a collective decision-making body, but there are people in that collective who, are, who wield disproportionate influence. In my view, particularly the, the first two, uh, Nafi Ali Nafi, the, the assist, assistant to the president, and the chief of security, overall security, Salah Abdallah Ghosh, these are the two people who consistently have been the leading, sort of the pointy end of the spear on, on the military strategy that the government of Sudan has pursued since it came to power against, first against southern Sudanese and now against Darfurians um, that have been, that have caused by far and away more destruction than anywhere else on the planet during the last 15 years besides Congo. And I mean, I just believe we ought to go right at the source of those and place a scarlet letter. We're not arresting them and, 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 and sentencing, we're not sending a military force to, 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 to annihilate these guys. But just put the scarlet letter on the shirt because in the past, when we've done these kinds of things, when we've spotlighted re particular elements of the regime or done that, it actually has affected their calculations. This isn't the Taliban. Bashir and company aren't Saddam Hussein ready to go down with a the ship. They want to play ball internationally. They want to get involved in the world. They, they wanted to be on the Security Council. They made a very big pitch in the last 
in 2000 to try to become a member of the Security Council, and the United States blocked uh, their ascension to it and, 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 and put Mauritius just as a, as a nice footnote to as the aspiring Security Council uh, country. So I think, there's, um, I think there's a lot we can do by using the tools that we had have, as Ambassador Rosen said, before we have to escalate to other more dramatic measures. The, very, the conventional diplomatic, economic, uh, uh, and political measures working multilaterally, aggressive diplomatic engagement and multilateral punitive measures have traction, have gained traction in the past, and I think we just need to do it. We just need to decide we're going to have to break a little China, literally and figuratively, to move this process forward and to get, uh, to get consensus around a particular plan that would bring a peace process, that, would br that could bring peace to Sudan, and to get the UNAU hybrid force that the world has basically agreed upon to be actually be deployed over the objections of the Sudanese government in Darfur to protect civilian populations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to thank every single one of our panelists here today. Thank you very much for your contributions. They are valuable to us. Uh, we will be following up on this and we will be working in, uh, in concert to take some action on that. We wish you all good luck and good fortune on what you have done. And uh, we are particularly grateful also for the testimony in the first panel today. I think we are all impressed by that. So thank you very, very much. With that, uh, there being no other questions, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Here's a look at our overnight schedule here on C-SPAN 2. Up next, a huge...